An Old Woman's Tale by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Old Woman's Tale by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the house where I was born, there used to be an old woman crouching all day long over the kitchen fire, with her elbows on her knees and her feet in the ashes. Once in a while she took a turn at the spit, and she never lacked a coarse gray stocking in her lap, the foot about half finished. It tapered away with her own waning life. And she knit the toe stitch on the day of her death. She made it her serious business and sole amusement to tell me stories at any time from morning till night in a mumbling, toothless voice. As I sat on a log of wood, grasping her cheek apron with both my hands. Her personal memory included the better part of a hundred years, and she had strangely jumbled her own experience and observation with those of many old people who died in her young days, so that she might have been taken for a contemporary of Queen Elizabeth or of John Rogers in the primer. There are a thousand of her traditions lurking in the corners and by places of my mind, some more marvelous than what is to follow, some less so, and a few not marvelous in the least, all of which I should like to repeat if I were as happy as she in having a listener. But I am humble enough to own that I do not deserve a listener half so well as that old toothless woman, whose narratives possessed an excellence attributable neither to herself nor to any single individual. Her ground plots, seldom within the widest scope of probability, were filled up with homely and natural incidents, the gradual accretions of a long course of years, and fiction hid its grotesque extravagance in this garb of truth, like the devil, an appropriate simile for the old woman supplies it, disguising himself, cloven foot and all, in mortal attire. These tales generally referred to her birthplace, a village in the valley of the Connecticut, the aspect of which she impressed with great vividness on my fancy. The houses in that tract of country, long a wild and dangerous frontier, were rendered defensible by a strength of architecture that has preserved many of them till our own times, and I cannot describe the sort of pleasure with which, two summers since, I rode through the little town in question, while one object after another rose familiarly to my eye like successive portions of a dream becoming realized. Among other things equally probable, she was wont to assert that all the inhabitants of this village, at certain intervals, but whether of twenty-five or fifty years or a whole century, remained a disputable point, were subject to a simultaneous slumber, continuing one hour's space. When that mysterious time arrived, the parson snored over his half-written sermon, though it were Saturday night and no provision made for the morrow. The mother's eyelids closed as she bent over her infant, and no childish cry awakened. The watcher, at the bed of mortal sickness, slumbered upon the death pillow, and the dying man anticipated his sleep of ages by one as deep and dreamless. To speak emphatically, there is a soporific influence throughout the village stronger than if every mother's son and daughter were reading a dull story, notwithstanding which the old woman professed to hold the substance of the ensuing account from one of those principally concerned in it. One moonlight summer evening, a young man and a girl sat down together in the open air. They were distant relatives, sprung from a stock once wealthy, but of late years so poverty-stricken that David had not a penny to pay the marriage fee, if Esther should consent to wed. The seat they had chosen was in an open grove of elm and walnut trees at a right angle of the road. A spring of diamond water just bubbled into the moonlight beside them, then whimpered away through the bushes and long grass in search of a neighboring mill-stream. The nearest house situate within twenty-five yards of them and the residence of their great-grandfather in his lifetime, was a venerable old edifice, crowned with many high and narrow peaks, all overrun by innumerable creeping plants, 
which hung curling about the roof like a nice young wig on an elderly gentleman's head. Opposite to this establishment was a tavern, with a well and horse trough before it, and a low green bank running along the left side of the door. Thence the road went onward, curving scarce perceptibly through the village, divided in the midst by a narrow lane of verdure, bounded on each side by a grassy strip of twice its own breadth. The houses had generally an odd look. Here the moonlight tried to get a glimpse of one, a rough old heap of ponderous timber which, ashamed of its dilapidated aspect, was hiding behind a great thick tree. The lower story of the next had sunk almost underground, as if the poor little house was a weary of the world, and retiring into the seclusion of its own cellar. Farther on stood one of the few recent structures, thrusting its painted face conspicuously into the street, with an evident idea that it was the fairest thing there. About midway in the village was a grist mill, partially concealed by the descent of the ground toward the stream which turned its wheel. At the southern extremity, just so far distant that the window paces dazzled into each other, rose the meeting house, a dingy old barn-like building, with an enormously disproportioned steeple sticking up straight into heaven as high as the Tower of Babel, and the cause of nearly as much confusion in its day. This steeple, it must be understood, was an afterthought, and its addition to the main edifice, when the latter had already begun to decay, had excited a vehement quarrel, and almost a schism in the church some fifty years before. Here the road wound down a hill and was seen no more, the remotest object in view being the graveyard gate beyond the meeting house. The youthful pair sat hand in hand beneath the trees, and for several moments they had not spoken, because the breeze was hushed, the brook scarcely tinkled, the leaves had ceased their rustling, and everything lay motionless and silent as if nature were composing herself to slumber. "'What a beautiful night it is, Esther,' remarked David, somewhat drowsily. "'Very beautiful,' answered the girl, in the same tone. "'But how still,' continued David. "'Ah, uh, too still,' said Esther, with a faint shudder, like a modest leaf when the wind kisses it. Perhaps they fell asleep together, and, united as their spirits were, by close and tender sympathies, the same strange dream might have wrapped them in its shadowy arms, but they conceived, at the time that they still remained wakeful by the spring of bubbling water, looking down through the village and all along the moonlighted road, and at the queer old houses, and at the trees which thrust their great twisted branches almost into the windows. There was only a sort of mistiness over their minds, like the smoky air of an early autumn night. At length, without any vivid astonishment, they became conscious that a great many people were either entering the village or already in the street, but whether they came from the meeting house or from a little beyond it or where the devil they came from was more than could be determined. Certainly a crowd of people seemed to be there, men, women, and children, all of whom were yawning and rubbing their eyes, stretching their limbs, and staggering from side to side of the road, as if but partially awakened from a sound slumber. Sometimes they stood stock still with their hands over their brows to shade their sight from the moonbeams. As they drew near, most of their countenances appeared familiar to Esther and David, possessing the peculiar features of families in the village, and that general air and aspect by which a person would recognize his own townsman in the remotest ends of the earth. But though the whole multitude might have been taken, in mass, for neighbors and acquaintances, there was not a single individual whose exact likeness they had ever seen before. It was a noticeable circumstance also that the newest fashion garment on the backs of these people might have been worn by the great grandparents of the existing generation. There was one figure behind all the rest, and not yet near enough to be perfectly distinguished. 
Where on earth, David, do all these odd people come from? said Esther with a lazy inclination to laugh. Nowhere on earth, Esther, replied David, unknowing why he said so. As they spoke, the strangers showed some symptoms of disquietude and looked towards the fountain for an instant but immediately appeared to assume their own trains of thought and previous purposes. They now separated to different parts of the village with a readiness that implied intimate local knowledge, and it may be worthy of remark that though they were evidently loquacious among themselves, neither their footsteps nor their voices reached the ears of the beholders. Wherever there was a venerable old house, of fifty years standing and upwards, surrounded by its elm or walnut trees, with its dark and weather-beaten barn, its well, its orchard and stone walls, all ancient and all in good repair around it, there a little group of these people assembled. Such parties were mostly composed of an aged man and woman with the younger members of a family. Their faces were full of joy, so deep that it assumed the shade of melancholy. They pointed to each other the minutest objects about the homesteads, things in their hearts, and were now comparing them with the originals. But where hollow places by the wayside, grass-grown and uneven, with unsightly chimneys rising ruinous in the midst, gave evidences of a fallen dwelling and of hearths long cold, there did a few of the strangers sit them down on the moldering beams and on the yellow moss that had overspread the doorstone. The men folded their arms, sad and speechless. The women wrung their hands with a more vivid expression of grief, and the little children tottered to their knees, shrinking away from the open grave of domestic love. And wherever a recent edifice reared its white and flashy front on the foundation of an old one, there a gray-haired man might be seen to shake his staff in anger at it, while his aged dame and their offspring appeared to join in their maledictions, forming a fearful picture in the ghostly moonlight. While these scenes were passing, the one figure in the rear of all the rest was descending the hollow toward the mill, and the eyes of David and Esther were drawn thence to a pair with whom they could fully sympathize. It was a youth in a sailor's dress and a pale slender maiden who met each other with a sweet embrace in the middle of the street. How long it must be since they parted, observed David. Fifty years at least, said Esther. They continued to gaze with unwandering calmness and quiet interest as if the dream, if such it were, unrolled its quaint and motley semblance before them and their notice was now attracted by several little knots of people apparently engaged in conversation. Of these, one of the earliest collected and most characteristic was near the tavern, the persons who composed it being seated on the low green bank along the left side of the door. A conspicuous figure here was a fine, corpulent old fellow in his shirt sleeves and flame-colored breeches, and with a stained white apron over his paunch beneath which he held his hands, and wherewith, at times be, wiped his ruddy face. The stately decrepitude of one of his companions, the scar of an Indian tomahawk on his crown, and especially his worn, buff coat, were appropriate marks of a veteran belonging to an old provincial garrison, now deaf to the roll call. Another showed his rough face under a tarry hat, and wore a pair of wide trousers like an ancient mariner who bad tossed away his youth upon the sea and was returned hoary and weather-beaten to his inland home there was also a thin young man carelessly dressed who ever and anon cast a sad look toward the pale maiden above mentioned with these there sat a hunter and one or two others and they were soon joined by a miller who came upwards from the dusty mill, his coat as white as if besprinkled with powdered starlight. All of these, by the aid of jests, which might indeed be old but had not been recently repeated, waxed very merry, and it was rather strange that just as their sides shook with the heartiest laughter, they appeared greatly like a group of shadows flickering in the moonshine. 
four personages, very different from these, stood in front of a large house with its periwig of creeping plants. One was a little elderly figure, distinguished by the gold on his three-cornered hat and sky-blue coat, and by the seal of arms annexed to his great gold watch chain. His air and aspect befitted a justice of peace and county major, and all earth's pride and pomposity were squeezed into this small gentleman of five feet high. The next in importance was a grave person of sixty or seventy years, whose black suit and hand sufficiently indicated his character, and the polished baldness of whose head was worthy of a famous preacher in the village half a century before, who had made wigs a subject of pulpit denunciation. The two other figures, both clad in dark gray, showed the sobriety of deacons. One was ridiculously tall and thin, like a man of ordinary bulk, infinitely produced, as the mathematicians say, while the brevity and thickness of his colleague seemed a compression of the same man. These four talked with great earnestness, and their gestures intimated that they had revived the ancient dispute about the meeting-house steeple. The grave person in black spoke with composed solemnity, as if he were addressing a synod, and the short deacon grunted out occasional sentences, as brief as himself. His tall brother drew the long thread of his argument through the whole discussion, and, reasoning from analogy, his voice must indubitably have been small and squeaking. But the little old man in gold lace was evidently scorched by his own red-hot eloquence. He bounced from one to another, shook his cane at the steeple, at the two deacons, and almost in the parson's face, stamping with his foot fiercely enough to break a hole through the very earth, though indeed it could not exactly be said that the green grass bent beneath him. The figure, noticed as coming behind all the rest, had now surmounted the ascent from the mill, and proved to be an elderly lady with something in her hand. Why does she walk so slow? asked David. Don't you see she is lame? said Esther. This gentlewoman, whose infirmity had kept her so far in the rear of the crowd, now came hobbling on, glided unobserved by the polemic group, and paused on the left brink of the fountain, within a few feet of the two spectators. She was a magnificent old dame, as ever mortal eye beheld. Her spangled shoes and gold clock stockings shone gloriously within the spacious circle of a red hoop petticoat, which swelled to the very point of explosion, and was bedecked all over with embroidery a little tarnished. Above the petticoat, and parting in front so as to display it to the best advantage, was a figured blue damask gown. A wide and stiff ruff encircled her neck, a cap of the finest muslin, though rather dingy, covered her head, and her nose was bestridden by a pair of gold-bowed spectacles with enormous glasses. But the old lady's face was pinched, sharp and sallow, wearing a niggardly and avaricious expression, and forming an odd contrast to the splendor of her attire, as did likewise the implement which she held in her hand. It was a sort of iron shovel, by housewives termed a slice, such as is used in clearing the oven, and with this selecting a spot between a walnut tree and the fountain, the good dame made an earnest attempt to dig. The tender sods, however, possessed a strange impenetrability. They resisted her efforts, like a quarry of living granite, and losing her breath, she cast down the shovel and seemed to bemoan herself most piteously, gnashing her teeth, what few she had, and wringing her thin yellow hands. Then, apparently with new hope, she resumed her toil, which still had the same result, a circumstance the less surprising to David and Esther, because at times they would catch the moonlight shining through the old woman and dancing in the fountain beyond. The little man in gold lace now happened to see her, 
and made his approach on tiptoe. How hard this elderly lady works, remarked David. Go and help her, David, said Esther compassionately. As their drowsy void spoke, both the old woman and the pompous little figure behind her lifted their eyes, and for a moment they regarded the youth and damsel with something like kindness and affection, which, however, were dim and uncertain, and passed away almost immediately. The old woman again betook herself to the shovel, but was startled by a hand suddenly laid upon her shoulder. She turned round in great trepidation and beheld the dignitary in the blue coat. Then followed an embrace of such closeness as would indicate no remoter connection than matrimony between these two decorous persons. The gentleman next pointed to the shovel, appearing to inquire the purpose of his lady's occupation while she, as evidently, parried his interrogatories, maintaining a demure and sanctified visage as every good woman ought in similar cases. Howbeit she could not forbear looking askew behind her spectacles toward the spot of stubborn turf. All the while their figures had a strangeness in them, and it seemed as if some cunning jeweler had made their golden ornaments of the yellowest of the setting sunbeams, and that the blue of their garments was brought from the dark sky near the moon, and that the gentleman's silk waistcoat was the bright side of a fiery cloud, and the woman's scarlet petticoat a remnant of the blush of morning, and that they both were two unrealities of colored air. But now there was a sudden movement throughout the multitude. The squire drew forth a watch as large as the dial on the famous steeple, looked at the warning hands and got him gone, nor could his lady tarry. The party at the tavern door took to their heels, headed by the fat man in the flaming breeches. The tall deacon stalked away immediately, and the short deacon waddled after, making four steps to the yard. The mothers called their children about them and set forth, with a gentle and sad glance behind. Like cloudy fantasies that hurried by a viewless impulse from the sky, they all were fled, and the wind rose up and followed them with a strange moaning down the lonely street. Now whither these people went is more than may be told. Only David and Esther seemed to see the shadowy splendor of the ancient dame as she lingered in the moonshine at the graveyard gate, gazing backward to the fountain. Oh, Esther, I have had such a dream, cried David, starting up, rubbing his eyes. And I such another, answered Esther, gaping till her pretty red lips formed a circle. About an old woman with gold-bowed spectacles, continued David, and a scarlet hoop petticoat, added Esther, they now stared in each other's eyes with great astonishment and some little fear. After a thoughtful moment or two, David drew a long breath and stood upright. If I live till tomorrow morning, said he, I'll see what may be buried between that tree and the spring of water. And why not tonight, David? asked Esther for she was a sensible little girl, and bethought herself that the matter might as well be done in secrecy. David felt the propriety of the remark, and looked round for the means of following her advice. The moon shone brightly on something that rested against the side of the old house, and on nearer view it proved to be an iron shovel, bearing a singular resemblance to that which they had seen in their dreams. He used it with better success than the old woman, the soil giving way so freely to his efforts that he had soon scooped a hole as large as the basin of the spring. Suddenly he poked his head down into the very bottom of this cavity. Oh ho! What have we here? cried David. End of an old woman's tale.